Thank you for this opportunity to do a virtual Quilter Save Our Stories interview with my best friend, longtime friend, Bets Ramsey. I'm in my house in Knoxville, Tennessee. She's in hers in Nashville. Next one. The quilt over the, um, the mantle is one called Broken Promises. Beth, just tell them the story of how this returned to your, your collection. Well, I made this quilt in uh, 2000, two, two years after I had moved to Nashville. And uh, it's made from Japanese silk fabrics that um, a friend in Japan had sent to me to um, use in my work. And um, a lot of things had been going on in my life. I just um, really wanted to uh, give a lot of thought to what went into this hanging, but it, it came about really naturally. And uh, two years after I made it, it was purchased by a friend of mine in uh, Clarksville, um, 30, 40 mil miles north of Nashville. And she was very proud to have this piece and put it in her dining room. So at Christmas time, she died this past Christmas. And um, I decided I wanted to try to buy the quilt back from the estate. So I contacted her daughter who had inherited her house and household and um, she agreed to let me purchase it. Um, so I was really glad to have it back because I consider that it's one of the nicer pieces I've made. And it just came at a time when my life was in a great transition after my husband had died and I was coming to Nashville to take residence here where my two sons live. So it's going to be with me now um, in my home until I have to leave. Um, so I'm very happy to have it back with me. Okay, the next one. Uh, but this is actually the first quilt, or not, a, it's not a quilt, it's a wall hanging that I made um, in my very early career, it's 1961. It was made as a christening present for Celia Applegate. And um, I had, at this time, I had um, four children and a husband who was a professor. And um, we didn't have very much money to buy christening presents. So I thought I'd just make something out of material. Excellent. It started this wall hanging. Uh, so it turned out to be a um, favorable present. It was accepted by Celia and her family. And um, strangely enough, Celia went on to uh, become a professor of German and now lives in Nashville and teaches at uh, Vanderbilt University. So the, the quilt has followed me here to Nashville and I'm so glad to be reunited with it. So when you made this quilt, you were living in Elmira, New York, is that correct? Yes. And what, you had graduated or you did you consider yourself a a budding artist what was your plan for your career well i was an art major in the university in chattanooga and um i don't know what you do with an art degree but mine was pretty scratchy because it was during the war time and so the first art professor i had went off to the army and the next two or so uh, were just substitutes. So I got off to a really bad start, but I did finish up with some really good teachers toward the end, but I was not prepared to have any particular job. So um, after I was married, my children were born, I started teaching children's art classes. And that was sort of the way I got into the art field. But then I got a job, um, right after graduating from college as a, a department head of the art department in a large paint store. And so this is where I was uh, contacting a lot of artists and this prepared me for a couple of years of doing this sort of um, supplying the artist's needs and just looking at artists from across the counter sort of thing. 
And I just determined that somehow I was going to be an artist in this art field in some way or other. But my university experience had not prepared me for any kind of occupation as an artist. Well, eventually I moved to New York State and uh, met some wonderful people in the, in the guild, the New York State Craft Guild. And I found out that making art was really a profession, just like um, being a teacher or a nurse or a secretary. You could earn your living as an artist. And that was what I was determined I was going to be. So I was lucky to meet people along the way and help me. And um, I began more and more to see myself entering into the art field. Amy, let's, let's jump to the first one about the stitchery, this one, yes. Uh, well, as you um, may have noticed, Mary Kay keeps calling these pieces quilts. But for the first 10 years of my art career, I was working in um, flat wall hangings um, that didn't have filler between them like a quilt is um, supposed to have three layers, you know, a top, a bottom, and a middle. So these were just uh, flat pieces. Uh, this was happened to be on linen. And um, I was very interested in the textiles that were um, available to me. And this uses a lot of um, upholstery material and sort of rough curtainy stuff that you could re uh, make fringe out of the edges of it and let the threads hang out. And then I'm winding around a lot of thread and yarn and all sorts of things. So it was uh, quite an experimental piece. Uh, also, I used some machine stitching in some parts of it, as well as applique. And um, we were living uh, on the West Coast at this time. And so I was very interested in the, the beach and the, the Pacific Ocean and quite carried away with that. So uh, this was really an experimental piece that um, I just found a great deal of freedom working in, and it, it was um, shown in several exhibitions in California while I lived there. The next one. Now, would, you might tell briefly what, what happened right before this, that where you actually did discover quilt making. And was there quilt making in your family? There was not quilt making in my family that I was aware of. Uh, my mother's mother was a rug maker. She booked rugs and that was her art form. And um, since I'd grown up in um, Illinois, I really didn't know my father's relatives. And um, his mother had died um, qu at quite an early age, long before I was born. So I never knew her. And it was much later that I found out that she was a very gifted quilt maker. But the way I got into quilting, um, in 1970, I'd been teaching at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And uh, the chairman of the art department suggested that I go to Knoxville and take a master's degree in art and crafts. And uh, then I would be better prepared and more qualified um, to, pe to be teaching in this department. So I agreed to that. And um, I went in 1970. I stayed in Knoxville during the week and then went home on weekends. And my husband was agreeable to all this since he was a professor and my kids were in high school so they could look out for themselves. Um, so one of the classes I had to take was required history of crafts in America. And uh, one of the topics, the only topic that was anything to do with fabric was um, quilt making. I really didn't like quilts very much, <laughs> um, but I took this class anyway because it was a research project. So I went to the stacks and looked at all the quilt books and there weren't that many at that time. And um, wrote my dissertation and put on a, a show of the things I had learned. So in effect, I was teaching myself 
how to make quilts and um, just being, being a self-taught quilt maker by reading the books and studying them and experimenting. Um, so one of the first quilts I made was called a friendship quilt. It sounded like a good idea because you sent a square of material around to all your friends and relatives and asked them to make a design and send it back in. And lo, you would have a quilt made to put together and make. So that's what I did. And it took um, a few months or maybe a year or so to get enough squares back to make a quilt. And you'll notice um, here that the San Francisco Bay Bridge is very prominent in the center. Well, that was made by my friend, Doris Hoover, um, an old Chattanooga friend that had moved to the West Coast. Uh, so it became a sort of a, a centerpiece for this quilt, of, um, the friendship quilt. And in fact, I did make a pair, a second quilt that, that made, went together later. And um, this one is now in the International Quilt Museum and was shown last year in an exhibition there. You know, we could, I'd be curious, how did you make the connection with the International Quilt Museum? And how did you get them to accept your quilts? Um, well, I had made, friends with uh, several of the people that were on the um, payroll of the museum. And um, the founder of it actually had uh, been someone I'd known, he and his wife I'd known for quite some time. So I had a little bit of edge there, uh, but it was just through association with um, different members of the museum that I had met at um, American Quilt Study Group meetings and throughout other connections. Um, and so um, little by little, I, I got to know uh, people that I could approach and inquire if they would like to have some of my quilts. I think- Let's, go to, let's I, go to the next one while she's talking. Uh, um, and I think one of the first ones I sent there was um, one I had made in the 70s as a part of an exhibition of the American Craft, I mean, the, um, the American Crafts Association um, for an exhibition in Tuscaloosa. And I've considered that it was a rather important um, modern quilt, sort of a branch from traditional to contemporary art. And that was the, the first one I gave. Uh, but this one is also in the collection and um, it has a rather strange story. Uh, I had two Japanese women who were in our quilt guild in Chattanooga. Their husbands were in um, industry uh, and earth, earth moving trucks and things that they were producing in Chattanooga. And these um, ladies loved to make quilts. They were very adept at the process. Uh, but they were uh, extremely shy and uh, didn't really want to uh, participate in conversation with American quilters. Uh, but they took a like to me, and uh, so we had uh, some good times together. And when they were uh, returning to Japan after their husbands were recalled, they gave me a number of scraps of some of their indigo dyed fabric. And I use these scraps and this, this freeform kind of um, uh, hanging that uh, just showed the, the beauty and the intricacy of these pieces. And many of them were actually um, from mending. The center panel was the interior of an old kimono jacket. And these were patches that were sewn on. So on the surface, the stitches were so invisible, you couldn't tell that the jacket had been mended at all. And I was so excited and delighted with um, this fabric that I wanted to pay homage to the people who had produced it, made it. And um, the background is a, a worn linen uh, sheet 
and uh, the border is a Japanese uh, stencil print, I believe, that my mother had had some curtains made out of in her kitchen when I was a young child. So it's all a um, very recycled kind of project that I had fun doing. And it, let's look at the next one. So then we go to Broken Promises, which uh, is the transition, uh, a more modern use of the fabric. This is silk kimono fabric, which uh, reflects the light. It has a real luster to it that the cotton fabric doesn't have when it's um, being shown. And so it's just quite exciting and vibrant. Um, but again, it's uh, using traditional materials uh, in, a, in a way that is um, moving into a modern interpretation of uh, quilt work uh, and, and, and expressing um, an emotional undercurrents of some way. And the next one. Uh, so this is in opposite to the silk hanging. This is um, a piece that's uh, made of contemporary cotton fabric. And I thought, um, I've been working so much with the indigo blues and these rich silk fabrics that uh, were so much a traditional part of the life of Japanese women, the um, dedication to their uh, traditional kimono when they, especially when they got married, uh, they had such an elaborate ceremony with all the underpinnings and so forth that had to go into their costume. Um, and so I thought I have some contemporary cotton material that I had received from one of my friends um, why not make something that is showing modern life in Tokyo after the world, the, after the war, when they were reclaiming their um, city again and, and opening it up to business and progress and just reclaiming all the lost energy that they had um, robbed, been robbed of during the war. war. So this shows the confusion and the rushing around and all that you would find in, in a large city in Japan at the time of um, getting ready to go home from work. Uh, so I tried to show all that um, rush and frenzy of getting your place on the train. And then finally you get off home, you're near your home in the outer outskirts of the city, perhaps, and find this uh, gentle, serene life that um, takes you back to more traditional ways. Uh, so I think it's interesting to have the concept of these two periods of Japan's progress. So, so we've kind of gone through the career in what, about six quilts. And you've in fact made over 1,000 quilts, is that correct? I've made uh, 1,040 as of the end of 2021. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Oh, they're the not next all quilts, one. you know. <laughs> yeah. So in 1998, you moved to Nashville. Yes. I remember when you moved to Nashville. Well, I, I think this was a... I think you were eating breakfast outside yeah. the patio. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was grieving for your house in Chattanooga. Uh, I, and I had watched when Paul died unexpectedly and how you spent the next two years, three years, downsizing, closing up that house, taking care of his collections, getting them to museums, I was very, very impressed with the way you could stick with it and, you know, with joy on your face. I'm sure there was a lot of sadness behind there, but, and then you landed in Nashville in that wonderful condo 
And I remember here, we, we're going to look at a few pictures going through of your first floor and your second floor. And I'm going to just ask you the question, how, how did the move to Nashville affect your quilt making, your quilt career? What was it about the place, the time? And we're talking about you moved there when you were about, what, 85 years old, maybe? So, yes, yeah, so I was 75. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, we, yeah. Well, I had, um, as I mentioned before, I had taught at the university in Chattanooga, and the chairman of the art department was a very good friend of mine. And um, he once told me when I was complaining about entering art shows and sending off slides and having to pack up the quilts. And it was just a terrible rigmarole to um, try to submit things to get in a show. And he said, you don't need to do that anymore. You've already had a stunning career and um, just do things that you want to do. Make your life what an artist could be, just pleasing yourself and forget about trying to do these competitive shows. You don't need that anymore. So that was my aim when I got to Nashville. I'm not going to get in the rat race of running around and trying to be competitive with all these bright young things that are coming along. So I just settled down and made things that I wanted to make. And I was still doing lecturing and um, I did some local quilt shows, curated some shows around for about six years. Um, but meanwhile, I was keeping records of all my work. And these are my scrapbooks that I kept. And the file boxes have a card and a picture, a photograph of, for each item I've made. And so um, I was keeping up with what I was doing, but I was doing things that I really liked to do. And eventually this turned into um, a sort of a self promoted um, annual show that I made. And I was first for, for five years, I was doing these shows to um, send money to a children's a girls' orphanage in Honduras. And I did that for five years. And then uh, when my girl that I was supporting graduated, I turned my attention to a new Episcopal school. And so for the last five years, I've been making shows and uh, having a show annually and selling the work um, to benefit this Episcopal school. Um, and so I've built up a really great following. And um, this year, everything was sold before the show even went up on the walls. So- <laughs> Before we get to that point, let's look at your studio. I don't see a design wall here. It, do, did you ever use a design wall? I also oh, don't yeah. see a hand, a quilt frame. How, how, did you, how do you make your quilts nowadays in this Nashville studio? Well, I do have um, large um, boards that I set around. You can see one there uh, in the back. It's um, just a, a large uh, show board and I just tack on my quilts there. Or, and I do have some larger boards too, but I don't have a wall that's uh, available to pin up. But because I'm working in smaller things, I'm not trying to do bed quilts anymore. Although I do have a um, half size quilt frame that I can set up and uh, quilt by hand um, in the frame. So I'm improvising. I'm just using uh, the space that I have and uh, making in uh, smaller quantities. And uh, I'm finding an audience. I know what the audience is interested in. And so I can kind of gauge what it is that uh, would appeal to them. And the fabrics. Well, fabric is 
the thing that you have to have. <laughs> and um, for a long time, I've really liked working with a Japanese fabric. And unfortunately, I've used up a lot of the pretty blues that I like so much, but uh, I still have other pieces and just I'll work with almost any kind of fabric. And in fact, um, you'll be surprised to know that I've used some plastic in a couple of hangings this past year. And here they are. These are the two. Um, I decided I was going to do a um, show emphasizing um, uh, conservation and recycling. So I called it Celebrating the Good Earth. And I was experimenting with the kind of uh, plastic bags that frozen food comes in. And so I did this uh, square piece block square imitating a flower sort of. And it was horrible to work with. It was just so slippery and <laughs> just didn't want to lend itself to uh, that process. But when I found out that I could just lay it down flat and do zigzag applique over it, it became much more interesting to, to work with it. And it did cause a lot of conversation, exactly what I wanted. People talked about conservation and that sort of thing. And uh, so several people uh, vied for this flower and butterfly that uh, was that one of the favorites. Um, and so they were both sold right away. No, no problem. <laughs> All right. So I'm doing experimenting. I like to try different things, you know, and uh, just uh, find, and just, in fact, I'm going back now and doing some more raw edge applique, not even turning under the edges of the blocks. Let's look at the next two. Well, the, well, there's that's the flyer for the yeah. zip. So there were what about how many? I, I had 31 uh, pieces this year, and not all of them went in the show. But um, this interesting one is in the lower center of uh, number twelve. It was a. Um, towel, a, a cotton printed towel that was sold for souvenirs in Japan, and it's uh, Mount Fuji, which is a, sim, a big symbol. Everybody loves Mount Fuji in Japan. And um, so the, the bloody red sunset on Mount Fuji was just so intense. I, I couldn't really feel what I wanted to do anything with it. I just didn't have a thought. And then I read somewhere that um, the plastic that's been grinding up in the ocean is being uh, cut into such tiny, in, um, impossibly visible uh, bits of the material, the plastic material that is sifting into the atmosphere. And they even found some on the top of Mount Everest. So I thought if that could be on Mount Everest, it could also fall on Mount Fuji. So I put little glass beads falling on the mountain and um, some French knots and so forth. And then down at the bottom, it has junk pieces of plastic that's sewn on there as waste. And um, to finish it off, I found an old piece of fabric that I had eraser printed uh, with a carved out eraser, like a block print. And I had uh, made this in my first class in graduate school in 1970. So when people ask me, how long does it take to make a hanging? I said, well, sometimes 50 years before <laughs> you really get through with it, because that was the first time I had an opportunity to use this bright printed fabric. And so that was sold, so we don't know. Oh, that was sold hot off the press. <laughs> wow. Let's go to the next one. Tell us about this quilt. I think this is the large one that you made a small uh, version of for the sale. No, um, actually, this one 
was one I made in 1998. And um, I made it when I was um, finishing up my packing of the boxes. And um, I kept it for a long time, but lately I've been trying to uh, sell some of my older pieces. And so I made it um, in, in 98 and then did a little remodeling later on and, and sold it this past year. Um, so one of the questions that we ask in Quilters Save Our Stories uh, interviews is, have you ever made a quilt that helped you get through a hard time? Well, that one was. This one might be it? Or? That one was because I was having to, um, I had a 10 room house and I had a contractor who practically lived at my house for six months, six weeks or so to um, whip it into shape. And, but I had, um, my house was full of bookcases because my husband was a professor and he studied uh, English and religion and poetry and just about everything else. So it took me a really long time to get rid of his books and his papers and negotiate with the um, University of North Carolina and other places to receive his, his work and his books. So it was a therapy for me while I was doing all this packing to just sit down and do these crazy patches and try to make some sense out of it. I really like this piece. Let's go to the next one. Japanese fabrics really show up a lot in your your body of work. This is a, and I, well, I'm attracted to them too, but um, this one in particular. Uh, this was from a um, tablecloth. It had, um, I think it had six of these emblems on it. Uh, and, but they were so intense, you know, that you just didn't want to use it as a, single piece. So um, I cut them up and used them as, as single units. And I think it's a, um, well, I'm not, I think it's a stencil print, I'm not sure. Uh, but then I combined uh, a tie dyed piece as a border and uh, this lower curly cue kind of piece is actually uh, from China, contemporary Chinese, um, tourist trade, I guess. It's it's a hand-stitched design done on a fabric. And so that kind of added a different element to it. Uh, but the, the strong blue and white impressions are just um, very easy to live with. And people really enjoy having them. While we're looking at this binding, is there, it's so tiny. I mean, you, we could look at the next quilt too. I think it's a, um, you know, you really, well, it, you, you, you're a master of tiny bindings. Is there any trick to them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember one, one time, um, I think it was in a North Carolina quilt show and I was judging the Quilts. I think we had three judges, and um, Mary Kay and I used, to, you know, we used to curate a lot of shows together, and we had certain uh, criteria that we stressed. And our first one always was it has to have a strong visual impression. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I always go for because I'm trained as an artist. But this the other judge that was with me. She studied every single binding on every quilt in that show. <laughs> I got so tired of hearing about bindings. But yes, I do think the binding is important. And sometimes I use a narrow binding and sometimes it's, it's wider. Uh, but it also is um, very important that this, the, the subtle um, finish that it gives, you have to be really careful about having something that doesn't overpower the piece, but uh, is compatible with it, and also gives it a little excitement, or, you know, a little 
instead of just having a plain color, this has a little tiny figure in it. So it gives a little um, activity along the edge of the piece. So that's what I look for in doing a binding. Okay, the next one. And this one I think shows your use of, uh, creative use of fabric. Again, these are very small. Um, you have a limited collection of fabrics now, but look at the variety. I, 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 I'm just thrilled by this one. And again, I'm, this one sold in that last exhibit, I'm sure. Well, this was a project I started out using um, squares. I had cut um, a four inch square in every piece of my material. And I had uh, used up a lot of the squares in a, several different hangings. And then so I then began cutting them in quarters like this, uh, cutting the squares across the diagonals so I could change the configuration. And so these were sort of the leftover pieces, these pastels and uh, not too strong colors that I had, that I'd used in the other places. And so these were just so four little patches that were sort of orphans. Mm -hmm. And I got the idea of um, using them as flower garden. And so I put this pathway down the center and then, oh, I found some material that had trees in it. So that was gonna be around the edge. And then there was some dirt looking soil at the bottom. And then I had some blue sky. So it all came together and made a little fence around it with a gate. And uh, I got it put together and I thought, oh, it's going to be called a bird's eye view of a little garden. And so it's just quite fun. And uh, I like to do things that have titles that really make a story with the quilt. And the next one, I think, well, this is. Tell this story. This is from your church. Well, we had a, a church service one uh, Sunday in uh, the fall, and it was to honor um, the seniors in the church because we have a very large, lively church, and it seems to center mostly around families and their children. But we have a lot of adults that have been faithful members there for many years. And so they were doing something um, special to emphasize the senior members of the, of the uh, church. And for some reason, they thought that I had played a leadership role in a number of different ways in the um, 22 years that I'd been going to this church. And I guess the latest thing which surprised everybody was um, that I've been teaching a memoir writing class for five years. And we have a really lively group of people that meet every month in this group. And so that had been a sort of uh, thing that caught people's attention. So I was picked out as member of the congregation to receive a lovely floral arrangement and acknowledge my part as a senior, senior member, uh, working right up to the end of my days, I hope, to uh, do things for, the, for my church. And this is our uh, rector yeah. ring at this time. All right. I think at the, yeah. And then, and then this lovely, go ahead, the next one, the memorial quilts are um, another kind of quilt that you're making here at the end and the end, the last uh, quarter of your life. <laughs> um, could you tell us about this one? Our representative, um, well, it's um, Cooper, not Cooley. Our uh, Cooper, local, excuse me. Local representative is Jim Cooper. That's and right. he's been in Congress for many, many years. Um, and uh, he comes from a political family, has uh, father was um, an ambassador to Peru and uh, other, he had judges in his ancestry and uh, one of his brothers is the mayor of Nashville right now. Uh, 
and Jim had uh, a wife who had uh, dementia uh, for several years in recent times. And so his life was pretty hectic, but um, his wife was just a really beautiful, lovely person. And she was um, not agitated as some people are, but she just sort of wandered around her house and, and often got her out in the yard and had to be watched, you know, so she wouldn't get away. Well, before they were married, she edited two uh, volumes of birds, American birds for the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, that was her career. She had been trained um, in university and academe for um, the study of birds. And uh, shortly after I met her, she passed away. And so I was so um, taken with her story and her life and, and her charm, even in her um, disabled condition, that I wanted to make a memorial quilt for her husband. And, um, and also because he had uh, received one of our books, The Quilts of Tennessee, and uh, was very impressed with it and had family, had quilts in their family home that he had inherited. Um, and he didn't realize that, um, or he didn't know me, but um, eventually he got to be a good friend with one of my sons. And so that was when I went out to his house in the country and met his wife. Um, so I, and so he had this real interest in, in quilt making. So I thought this would be a very nice memorial for him to have. And um, it turned out he was very pleased. And, and also one of his brothers came to me with tears in his eyes one day and said how thoughtful it was to have this memory of her in, in a quilt. Let's look at the next one. Another memorial quilt done recently for Linda Clausen, who passed away last year. And she's someone that you and I know. She was in that picture uh, that we showed at the beginning of the group of AQSG friends around the dinner table at our house. Um, I gave you some, well, her family gave us some scraps that were a lot. I mean, it was her quilt, her fabric stash and some pieces. So I, I handed some over to you and I thought, well, let's see what Bets makes with them. And within a month, or it seemed like it was a very short amount of time, she sent this wonderful, she told me she'd made this wonderful, this quilt and I picked it up and I'm going to share it with our quilt guild. Um, what, what was different about what were you trying differently in this quilt? Or what, what was your... Well, um, there's a long story that goes with this. Yeah. Because these materials were very special. Uh, Linda was involved with um, saving a quilt that, well, it, it has a very interesting story, but um, in saving this quilt that was made with fabric that was pre uh, commercially dyed material. And so uh, Linda and I don't know who else wanted- The Thursday to, bee, the Thursday bee. The Thursday bee uh, wanted to make a reproduction of this quilt uh, made with tiny, tiny little squares and bits. And Linda, I don't know if she sweet talked Jim Lyles or who offered to get his services, but he was a professor at University of Tennessee who was a, a dye expert that is in natural dyeing. And so these materials are primarily those natural dyed colors that are just, they just have a rich earthy quality to them that uh, commercial dyes don't have. Uh, so it was exciting to use them. Most of these, pieces were already cut out 
and a few of them had been pieced together by Linda. So I just kind of followed all of the scraps that were in this collection and um, arranged them in this way. But they were very limited in um, their size and so forth. So I just decided to applique them on with raw edges. And I don't know how long it's gonna last. It was gonna start unraveling or fall apart, but maybe that'll be part of its story. But you can see that um, it's not it's down in the bottom there. It's uh, kind of rough looking. And so it's um, got a little uh, perilous uh, future to it, but uh, I just couldn't bear to cover up any of that beautiful material. And we might end on this quilt and um, with a question about, I think we've, we've learned how you keep ideas coming. We could see the result of that. I think keeping young, being open to new ideas, being willing to try things, looking for your audience. I think we've learned all these things in the this, um, in our interview. Um, but you are going to turn 100 years old. We now can say next year because this this talk is being uh, recorded on in 2022, January. Um, what are you proudest of in your in your career? Or how do you think the future, what, what, what's still ahead for you? I get we could talk future wise, we could look back, whichever you choose. What do you see as your future? Or what do you what are you proud of from your past? Well, um, I'll take the take the one from the past because you pointed this out a few days ago. Um, you quoted something I'd said about um, being very um, pleased um, when a, a person in my class um, gets to a, an awakening point or gets to, to finish a project that uh, makes them show that they could do something they hadn't known they could do before. Their self-satisfaction and uh, joy in creating something. And so that was, uh, something that gave me a great deal of pleasure when I realized that I'm just not um, shoveling out this information and giving it to people, but they're really using it and it's becoming uh, part of them and part of their satisfaction and their growth. Um, so what am I doing now to look ahead? Um, I guess I'm in these past 10 years when I've been uh, working more or less in a local um, situation, uh, and especially the last five years doing the work for the Episcopal School of Nashville, um, I've sort of created my own audience and I can uh, predict the kinds of things people will be attracted to. You know, there's, things with a bit of humor that are gonna to appeal to some people and um, other work that's um, suitable for a child and so forth. Um, and so it, it pleases me that the work I do is pleasing to my the people who, who buy them. And they really get quite emotional sometimes about uh, something that uh, strikes a, a chord. And one example was a, a small piece that was made from some of these um, blues, the Japanese uh, indigo dyed material. And as you'll see later, um, I made a piece for Mary Kay and Jerry that was from some of these. Let's really go beautiful, look at that one. Yeah. Beautiful, elegant, um, indigo pieces. And uh, so 
is kind of the last of these great design elements of this fabric that I have. So I made another piece, a smaller piece out of scraps from these blue things. And um, I called it Bye Bye Blues because I'm not gonna have these wonderful large pieces anymore. Well, a friend of mine bought this piece and it's just really not very impressive. It's just little scraps that are kind of an abstract design. She decided she was going to give it to a Japanese couple that lived here in Knoxville, in Nashville. Um, they're doing some um, university work, I believe. And they're a young couple and they plan to go back to Japan. Well, she decided she was gonna give this piece to them. And they were very thrilled to have a piece of Japan in their house here in Nashville and something that they could take back to remember. So I think it's pleasing the people that I give things to or sell them to uh, because it means something to them and it reaches something in their spirit. Well, I feel like we've gone full circle. I think we've got, uh, we've had a wonderful, I've enjoyed talking with you like I always do. And is there anything else you'd like to add? We could talk also in the question and answer period, but is there anything you'd like to add? Any question you wish I'd asked? <laughs> um, oh, there's, you know, there's always lots we can talk about. And um, so how, maybe we've talked enough. <laughs> how I um, keep my records. You know, I started all this out before I even knew how to type or use a computer. And so everything was just by hand when I started and it's still very primitive. And if I were going to art school today, I know that I would learn lots of technical things that would help me along and make life much easier for me than they have been. But I do have records on most everything I've made. And um, all of my work is going to be some of it is already in the Tennessee State Library and Archives. Um, so I know that it's going to have a good home. Well, thank you for bringing that up. That is the area I, I wanted to cover and didn't get a chance to. And documentation. How important is the documentation for uh, of quilts in your mind? Well, you do have to keep track of what you're doing. And um, especially if you make connections and sell or give things to museums, they want records that um, tell you where the piece has been exhibited, if it's been in shows, or you know what its background is, how, how it came to be. Uh, because the backstories to quilts are what makes them interesting. And um, you know, you remember the time that you uh, showed a we showed quilts in one of our quilt surveys and you later found a quilt at the flea market and the man wouldn't tell you anything about it, but he remembered these two women that had told them to keep records of everything. <laughs> so I don't know if you ever found any more from him or not, but- In fact, least... I was thinking of putting that that quilt behind me for this uh, interview because yeah there are many stories like that that came from our quilt days but yes that was exactly right he <laughs> you know when he was selling the quilt and he I said do you have any do you know anything about the quilt maker and he said well there were these two ladies that came through a year or so ago and they were asking about quilts and my wife took the quilt and they filled out a form and um wait, I'll go to my truck and I'll bring it to you. So, you know, mm -hmm. something, it, it was full circle, you know, something that we had proposed and put out there and the, the importance of documenting and that that woman's name, her birth and death dates, where she lived, will go with that quilt forever. So, and that's, I think, true with your quilts too. Every one of them, I think, seems to have a name on the back and information about it. So. 
All right. Well, I think that's uh, in that's plenty, and um, we'll look forward to the question and answer period. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. <laughs> yes. Thank <laughs> you.